How about now? Yeah, that's perfect. All right. Uh, so thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give this lecture today. This is my second Empire lecture, uh, turning to a trend. Um, uh, so yeah, let's get started. So I have no uh, relevant disclosures, financial or otherwise. The one uh, sort of non-relevant disclosure, though potentially relevant, is that I did train at Memorial, as mentioned, and, and I've been indoctrinated by the great Joel Scheinfeld. Uh, for my management strategies for testis cancer. So uh, uh, I stick to the guidelines for the most part, but I do editorialize a couple times, but I'll let you know when I do, I promise. Um, and I do promise also to uh, get to the thing that you're all waiting for, which is to figure out and find out if uh, you do really need to radiate that transcrotal orchiectomy scar that's asked about every year. So approaching the in-service, just a few uh, brief words on uh, things in general. Uh, testis cancer, when I was a resident, uh, including for me, was, was a tough topic. Uh, it seems that there are just all sorts of treatment algorithms and, and things, things to remember. Uh, so I hope to simplify things a little bit today. Uh, but in general, the way I approached uh, studying for the in-service, testis cancer or not, was really to do the SASP questions. Uh, look at the core curriculum, and then study some of the guidelines. And, and really, that's where the vast majority of the questions come from. So uh, in addition to learning, you can kind of figure out based on prior years uh, what they're going to ask about. And I do uh, do a little bit of an assessment of the last five years of all the testis cancer questions that have been included uh, right after I finish up and before we dive into some questions themselves. So to get started, uh, really, uh, you know, starting from the top and working down, uh, testis cancer is a disease of young men. Um, the incidence is about six per 100,000, making it a rare cancer. Uh, only about 10,000 cases per year uh, are diagnosed. And the median age of diagnosis is around 33. And as you can see from the distributions on the right here, um, that uh, this is predominantly a cancer diagnosed in men in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, the vast majority of men do present with localized disease, uh, most of which is uh, localized seminoma but only about 10 to 30% of men will present with metastatic disease. However, fortunately, there's excellent survival among all comers. And, and this is, I think, worth taking a second just to touch upon is really uh, starting from the 70s up until modern day, the, really the, the reason why there's excellent survival for, for germ cell tumor uh, for all comers is really the discovery and use of cisplatin-based chemotherapy that was, that was popularized in the late 70s and early 80s. And that has really gotten us to the era where we're at today. So some risk factors. These are questions that are asked about all the time on, uh, on the in-service. And, and I think the big three that you really need to worry about are cryptorchidism, or undescended testes, uh, personal or family history of testicular cancer, and then the presence of intratubular germ cell neoplasia, which is usually diagnosed on testis biopsy. And this paper over here to the right is really uh, what I think is a beautifully done uh, epidemiologic study uh, that assesses the risk of testis cancer in undescended testes and the risk of, of orchidopexy. Uh, in influencing long-term outcomes. And this study really shows, and I think it's worth a read for anyone, that uh, doing an orchidopexy before uh, puberty really does have a protective effect on uh, the risk of germ cell tumor developing, and really doing one afterwards is, is really where the risk really increases. Uh, it's also important to remember that about a 5% of germ cell tumors do originate at extragonadal sites, and that is largely the retroperitoneum and the mediastinum. So breaking things down, uh, in general, uh, you know, the umbrella of testis tumors uh, can really be split up into three different buckets. Uh, the first one is stromal tumors, which are made up of Leydig cell tumors, Sertoli cell tumors, granulosa cell tumors. These are largely thought of as, as benign uh, uh, tumors, although there are some exceptions. Uh, the other tumors, uh, which are going out of blastomas, mostly found in children, uh, lymphomas and metastases, and then obviously uh, the germ cell tumors, which makes up the vast majority of tumors in the testis. And that's a good mix of uh, pure seminoma and mixed or non seminomous germ cell tumors. So th there is a, a pretty clean uh, split between those two histologies. So this is critical to understand, I think, because it really tells the story about how uh, we approach the treatment of seminoma versus non-seminoma, and it also gives you a good idea of why uh, certain tumors will produce uh, uh, certain tumor markers and certain tumors will um, sort of develop the way that they do. Um, and we know that uh, uh, spermatocytic seminoma, which is largely a, 
uh, an indolent uh, type of cancer that's that's discovered in, in more elderly men uh, does not develop uh, from intratubular germ cell neoplasia, but every other type of germ cell tumor does. And you can see here the branch in histology is really a story of a differentiation cascade. So germ cell intratubular germ cell neoplasia differentiates into seminoma. And then it can differentiate into embryonal carcinoma, which is really a totipotent uh, histologic subtype. Um, and, and really, this kind of tells a story about why we treat seminoma and non seminomous germ cell tumors differently. And embryonal can then de differentiate into choreo, yolk sac, into somatic, and then into teratoma. And this is really uh, uh, how and why we, we treat some non seminomous uh, germ cell tumors differently. Uh, important to reiterate here that embryonal carcinoma and yolk sac tumors are totipotent, and that is the reason why they produce AFP and can have teratoma in the specimen. And this is a little bit of, of inside baseball here, but it does hopefully frame uh, some of uh, the things I'm going to talk about later. So some general histologic pearls, and these are things also that are, that are tested very frequently on the in-service, uh, is that seminoma is uh, made up of syncytiotrophoblasts and about 15% of seminoma tumors, pure seminoma tumors. And this is why um, uh, certain seminomas do produce beta HCG, and this is produced in these cells. Embryonal, as I mentioned, is totipotent. And choreo, the things to remember uh, about choriocarcinoma is that it, it likes to spread more hematogenously rather than lymphatically. Uh, there's something called choriocarcinoma syndrome, which is an extremely high uh, beta HCG from a very, very high tumor burden uh, that leads to cross-reactivity with LH and TSH receptors and has all sorts of downstream hormonal comp uh, consequences because of that. Uh, choreo can bleed. It goes to the brain. It can cause bleeding brain mets. And this generally requires urgent chemotherapy. It's just uh, one of these things that I think is worth remembering, the choreo syndrome. Uh, the other thing when it comes to yolk sac tumor, the histology and pathology is not tested as much these days as it was in the past. Um, but if you think Schiller Duval bodies, which are looks like these glom uh, glomerulations over here on the right, uh, you can think yolk sac tumor. And this is more common pre-pubertal pre children. And then uh, just knowing that teratoma is both chemo and radio resistant uh, helps understand why we do uh, surgical resections for these. So to take a big step back and get back into more some of the clinical basics and principles is uh, how do you evaluate someone with a suspected testicular tumor? And, and the most common symptom for these is a painless testicular mass. Uh, this is something that either the patient or their partner discovers. Uh, sometimes it's, it is discovered uh, because of some sort of trauma or, or other inciting events. Uh, but it always uh, necessitates investigation. Uh, more commonly, uh, additional symptoms outside of a painless testicular mass are, or mass are usually related to metastatic disease. So this is back pain, uh, any sort of palpable abdominal mass, a supraclavicular mass, uh, and then shortness of breath or hemoptysis is usually associated with uh, uh, advanced uh, lung, uh, lung burden. Uh, in, in men with a testicular mass, as, as you all hopefully know, uh, should undergo a scrotal ultrasound as the initial diagnostic study. You should obtain serum tumor markers, uh, and then you should consider going for a radical inguinal orchiectomy. And this involves high ligation at the internal ring, and that is to uh, make your removal of the cord at the time of possible RPLND better and also for uh, or easier. And this is also for better uh, cancer control should there be any uh, invasion of the um, spermatic cord. Um, it's always important to discuss uh, fertility preservation. This is uh, something that I think is underappreciated and, and worth uh, uh, repeating here uh, prior to orchiectomy and then certainly prior to uh, chemotherapy. Um, and then you're going to want to proceed to complete staging either before or after orchiectomy. There's really no uh, compelling reason for each unless you think there's advanced disease. So staging. Uh, serum tumor markers are important to be sent, as I said, before the orchiectomy and then again afterwards, usually about four to five weeks after the orc. Uh, is where you'll start to see hopefully a nadir, and this is important to remember your half-lives, and I'll go into that in a second. Uh, staging imaging is uh, always a CT abdomen pelvis plus chest imaging. I think a chest x-ray, according to most of the guidelines, is suitable for low risk only, but if there's any evidence of, of or suspicion for uh, metastatic disease, a CT chest is essential. Uh, the rule of thumb that I've been taught and that I'd like to tell people is that you stage past the level of disease. So in addition to your sort of routine abdominal pelvic imaging, if there's uh, retroperitoneal lymph nodes or any visceral disease, then you must stage the chest with a CT. If there's disease in the chest and the CT, then it's important to consider at least a brain MRI. Uh, a brain MRI, though, is definitely indicated for anyone with questionable neurologic symptoms, anyone who's got serum tumor markers that put them at S2 or S3 levels, 
and then to consider when there's pure choreal carcinoma in the org specimen or in the biopsy, because this is very high risk for brain mets. I think when you're sending uh, serum tumor markers, it's important to also be aware of false positive elevations in prepubertal boys and uh, patients with certain uh, marijuana use or liver disease. And the other thing that's very important uh, and something that Dr. Scheinfeld taught me and reiterates all the time, and if you don't know Dr. Scheinfeld, he's an absolute legend in the field of uh, testicular cancer and uh, I have a very strong fondness for this man. And he's taught me uh, pretty much everything I know about testicular cancer. And what he says is you're only stage once. And, and this is certainly true. Um, and it really helps sort of understand uh, the, the treatment paradigms and helps organize your thoughts. So keep this in mind as I, as I start talking and go down into these treatment algorithms is that you're only initially staged once. So the staging is broken down in the traditional TNM classification plus the serum tumor markers, which is a special consideration for testicular cancer. Uh, this is something I think is, is worth looking at probably the night before the exam and, and sort of uh, trying to get an idea in your head about where things uh, are organized when it comes to just the TNM staging. Uh, however, the critical component of staging, in especially T-staging, is that lymphovascular invasion in the orchiectomy, orchiectomy specimen will always give you a T2 tumor. If you can remember that, you will uh, you know, get most of these staging questions correct because that is usually the crux of, of the kind of dividing point between a T1 and T2 tumor and figuring out some uh, subsequent treatment options is this lymphovascular invasion. Uh, in recent uh, guidelines, they did announce that specifically for seminoma only, uh, breaking things down to 1A and 1B based on the tumor size is another consideration. Uh, now, nodal spread, and keep in mind this is clinical nodal stage, is broken down uh, according to size. Less than two centimeters is clinical uh, node 1 or N1, whereas 2 to 5 is N2, and 3 uh, is, is greater than 5 centimeters. The critical component of this that I think you should remember is that this only applies to retroperitoneal nodes. Any nodes outside of the retroperitoneum are actually considered M1A disease. So if you have pelvic lymph nodes or any sort of aberrant uh, lymphadenopathy, then that is not an N positive, that is potentially an M positive patient. The clinical staging, again, this is uh, uh, hopefully organized to help you remember it a little bit better, is that when you think clinical stage one, think testis cancer localized to the testis. And from there, it's broken down based on your T stage. So clinical stage 1A is T1, 1B is T2 to T4. Now, if you're thinking clinical stage two, you're thinking spread to the retroperitoneum. This is the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. And similar to T1, it's broken down according to subdivisions of your retroperitoneal lymph adenopathy. A, B, and C correspond to one, two, and three, similar to the uh, uh, clinical stage one. It's important to recognize the caveat to this is that these can only be uh, S0 or S1. So these are not patients. Anyone who's uh, S2 or 3 cannot be a clinical stage 2 patient. However, if you organize it, testis, RP spread, 1, 2, then you'll, you'll remember very simply uh, that clinical stage 3 is distance spread. And the distance spread subdivisions of staging here are based on your tumor markers, ABC, 1, 2, 3, same deal. Uh, and this actually uh, organizes very nicely with good intermediate and poor risk disease as well. And it is uh, uh, critical to understand that there is no stage four disease in testis cancer. Serum tumor markers. These are things you just need to memorize. The half-lives, uh, these are tested occasionally, AFP five to seven days, beta HCG a day to a day and a half, and then LDH is about 24 hours. Um, uh, AFP is never elevated in SEM, so if you get an orchiectomy specimen that has pure seminoma and then you have an AFP elevation four to five weeks after that orchiectomy, this patient does not have seminoma. They have non-seminomatous germ cell tumors. Uh, the presumption is that there are discordant pathology in, in the retroperitoneum or somewhere that is producing AFP, therefore you treat them like a non-seminomatous germ cell patient. Uh, and Brinal and Corio produce beta HCG as the seminoma, as I mentioned, about 15% of the cases. Uh, very high, has cross-reactivity with LH and TSH, that choriocarcinoma syndrome that I mentioned, and then marijuana users and liver disease can have some uh, low sort of smoldering aberrations in AFP and beta-HCG that it's important to be aware of. LDH is a bit of a controversial uh, tumor marker in certain situations. Very uh, few uh, treatment decisions are made based on LDH alone. Uh, we like to think of this as mostly a proxy for disease burden, especially teratoma and the retroperitoneum and bulkiness. Uh, and if you're looking at a specific isotype, it's LDH isotype 1 that is specific to testis cancer. Otherwise, you're getting all sorts of other markers of cell turnover. Uh, 
So this is the IGCCCG uh, risk for advanced disease. And I, I look at this and I think it's actually quite complicated. There's all sorts of numbers everywhere, you know, all sorts of footnotes and endnotes and, and stuff that it's really confusing. And I, and I think if you really want to boil this down, uh, you can boil it down to basically this. And this is if you have a non-seminomatous germ cell tumor patient, it doesn't matter what their metastases are. If they are S1 and they don't have anything in the poor risk category, then they're good risk. If they're S2 and they don't have anything in the poor risk category, then they're intermediate risk. So then basically it rules everything else out. So if you have a mediastinal primary, someone with non-pulmonary visceral mets, so this is brain mets, liver mets, uh, uh, kidney mets, if that's a, uh, something... Uh, or S3 that puts you in poor risk. And I think this really boils down from this to this very nicely. If you just kind of ignore a lot of the other noise, you say, okay, well, is this person poor risk? If they're not poor risk, then okay, what are their tumor markers? S1, good risk. S2, intermediate risk. Similar with seminoma, there's no such thing as a poor risk seminoma patient. And then boiling it all down, it doesn't matter what um, what uh, anything else is. If they have pulmonary mets and, and no non-pulmonary mets, then they're good risk. If they have pul non-pulmonary mets, then they're intermediate. And this obviously is, is provided that uh, uh, AFP is normal. So that is a truly a seminoma. But I think this is a very distilled down version to simplify uh, risk uh, uh, stage designation in advanced disease. And keep in mind, these risk designations are only uh, for advanced metastatic disease. This is not something you do for localized disease. So speaking of metastatic disease, uh, considering metastatic spread, uh, testis cancer has a largely predictable sort of Halsteadian spread, uh, provided there's uh, a normal testicular descent, no prior surgeries. Uh, these lymph nodes, as the testes descend down from around where the kidneys are in utero down into the scrotum, uh, surely around the time of birth, uh, are, are mapped to the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Um, as you can see here, it's, uh, uh, each of these regions has a, a name, uh, the pre-cable, para-cable, intra-aortocable, uh, and, and para-aortic, as well as the iliac uh, regions are, are pretty widely accepted nomenclature for these regions, and these correspond to the areas um, that people do uh, templated dissections, and it, it's just a common means of, of discussing uh, surgical anatomy. H however, I think the important thing to remember here is that right-sided tumors are largely interaortic cable predominant. These are mapping studies. These are pictures of mapping studies that show the landing zone of metastatic spread from a right-sided tumor. So despite the fact that this is a right-sided predominant tumor, most of these uh, lesions actually occur in the interaortic cable space. Whereas on a left-sided tumor, because there is very, very little uh, spread from the left over to the right, whereas the normal lymphatic channels do cross from the right over to the left, a left-sided tumor basically has no right-sided uh, spread um, uh, on, on this particular mapping study. And the predominant uh, nodal region is actually the paraortic region with a little bit of interaortic cable and uh, uh, pre-aortic uh, pre uh, nodes here. So talking about the treatment of localized testis cancer, uh, briefly before we get into that, I think it's worth mentioning uh, intratubular germ cell neoplasia and how this is a pre-malignant precursor to germ cell tumors. This is asked about occasionally. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is usually discovered on biopsy for an infertility workup when you're doing a TESI or something similar. Um, what's important to remember here is that 50% of untreated uh, germ cell neoplasia will develop into testis cancer in five years. Um, so this, this is you know, as close to a coin flip certainty as it, as it gets. Um, uh, so it, it is worth both uh, uh, discussing this with the patient and considering some sort of management strategy, whether that's surveillance, uh, which is given uh, priority if there are infertility concerns and the patient just needs to be watched very closely with serial exams and ultrasounds. Um, orchiectomy, I think, is probably uh, a bit too aggressive, at least up front, unless you see uh, a trajectory developing here. Uh, XRT, which does cure about 100% of patients where 20 gray is given to the testis, or chemotherapy is a consideration, though I would not uh, really consider this uh, a, a great option because it only eradicates about two-thirds of disease uh, and is infrequently given uh, because of the obvious side effects of chemo. However, if a patient has a bilateral uh, a testis tumor where one side is a real tumor and they have a disseminated disease and the other side just has intratubular germ cell neoplasia, this will actually eradicate that contralateral ITGCN uh, during the treatment of metastatic disease, which will decrease the risk of a, a, a metachronous second primary. 
So clinical stage one seminoma is very frequently tested. It is uh, the most common situation you'll probably encounter in practice. Uh, the good news with clinical stage one seminoma is over 80% of these patients will be cured with orchiectomy alone. Uh, the disease specific survival is fantastic regardless of what your initial management strategy is. And the important uh, caveat to that is if everything you do is going to end up uh, doing well for the patient, you have to balance the treatment side effects and have those be an important consideration as well. Uh, in clinical stage one seminoma patients that are managed with surveillance, most of them relapse within the first two years. This is what is designated as an early relapse. First two years is, is that designation. And they are rare to relapse after five years. Uh, and, and although some guidelines do say it is okay to stop surveillance after five years because of a very low risk, I think it is important to continue to see these patients uh, so they do not uh, develop uh, bad disease in the long term. So when it comes to post-orchiectomy treatment strategies, I tried to break this down uh, according to relapse rate and then comment a little bit about uh, uh, some of these, uh, the uh, nuance to these um, strategies. Uh, surveillance is preferred according to the NCCN guidelines and I think uh, preferred according to most people who treat a lot of testis cancer. However, uh, the caveat to that is that it requires good compliance. Uh, and I know Dr. Litwin, who is uh, another testis cancer giant, uh, really harps on, on this being a very important component of, of uh, uh, when, you're, when you're discussing clinical stage one seminal management is how good uh, compliance or is this patient going to have? Because if this gets out of out of hand, you may lose the risk, or you may lose the window for for curative treatment. Um, so if if you do have some concerns, or if the patient is risk averse, the two other options are single agent carboplatin and uh, radiation to the retroperitoneum, which is largely uh, a curative in most cases. Uh, these are, are sort of non significant differences. Uh, the single agent carboplatin is usually given in one cycle, although it has been studied in two, but one cycle is generally the standard. And the AAU actually no longer recommends uh, radiation to the retroperitoneum for clinical stage one seminoma because of some of the long-term side effects. Now, in, in patients who relapse, uh, as I mentioned, you're only staged once. So patients who relapse are, relapse, are managed according to their disease risk uh, uh, in the IGCCCG uh, profile. So once you're staged, you're treated according to your stage. Once you relapse, you're treated according to your risk status. So there's two important clinical stage one trials that have been tested in the past, and I think it's important to know some of the details about. The first one is Swinoteca 5, and this was published in JCO in 2011. Uh, and this is uh, a trial that was done in uh, Sweden and Norway, which standardized a population level treatment protocol for or all patients with early stage uh, testis cancer and essentially compared the relapse rates between surveillance, carboplatin, radiation. Uh, this gave us a lot of good data on the time to relapse, the location of relapse, uh, and also um, some of the uh, uh, pr uh, predictors of relapse and surveillance. I think the thing to remember here is that in patients who do have clinical stage one seminoma, most all of them relapse in the abdomen, uh, and the vast majority were actually in the abdomen alone, which kind of uh, gives credence to that very Halsteadian lymphatic spread that we see in seminoma that we don't necessarily see in non-seminoma. The other trial to be aware of is the EORTC 3982 trial, and this is an RCT that demonstrated the non-inferiority uh, between chemotherapy and radiation therapy uh, that recruited uh, about 1,500 patients. Uh, and it showed that the two-year uh, recurrence-free survival rate between radiation and single-agent carboplatin was roughly similar. Uh, however, they did note, as I alluded to earlier, that there's fewer uh, metachronous second testicular cancers in the chemotherapy arm. So when discussing non-seminomatous germ cell tumors, so this is a change. The prior discussion was from seminoma. This is non-seminomatous germ cell tumors. So about 25 to 30% of these men will relapse. And again, similar to seminoma, cure is, is basically universal in these patients, regardless of your initial treatment strategy. However, the important thing to remember here is that there are slightly different risk factors for relapse in non-SEM than seminoma. And the things to remember are really lymphovascular invasion, that is uh, going from PT1 to PT2, and embryonal predominance in the orchiectomy specimen. And then there is some question about whether Reedy testis invasion does have a significant influence on top of LVI and embryonal predominance. Uh, and as you can see here, the hazard ratios of the, of the individual risk factors and then the combined risk factors really show you how if you have uh, several of these risk factors in brown carcinoma, lymphovascular invasion, then your hazard for relapse is, is much, much higher. 
similar to uh, seminoma in uh, about 95% of patients uh, that relapse are going to relapse in the first two years. The median time is roughly about eight months. Uh, most relapse in the retroperitoneum and 90% of those that relapse are good risk at the time of relapse. So similar to the management of seminoma, you have three uh, main choices. Uh, the alternative to radiation therapy in seminoma is that you have the option to do a primary retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in the management of clinical stage one seminoma, non-seminoma stem cell tumor, excuse me. Um, looking at the relapse rates between the similar uh, w without risk factors and risk factors obviously shows you the large difference that those risk factors play in. Uh, in surveillance, it's really preferred only in early stage non-seminominous germ cell tumors that do not have risk factors. So these are patients without lymphovascular invasion, without embryonal predominance, and probably without a reedy testis invasion. Um, the other difference between seminoma and non-seminoma non germ cell tumors here is that the uh, chemotherapy agent is actually BEP times one rather than carboplatin uh, as it was in, in seminoma. So I think uh, either of these in patients who are clinical stage 1B is a, uh, a, very, reasonable, um, a very reasonable treatment strategy. And then I'm um, going to talk a little bit in a sec about uh, primary retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, I don't have the outcomes listed here for RPLND because it really depends on uh, the actual uh, pathologic node stage at the time of RPLND. And that's one of the big benefits of actually doing the RPLND in clinical stage one non-SEM is that you get a very accurate staging. Um, similar to seminoma, relapse after initial management strategy is managed according to risk status and based on the prior treatment given. So you do your primary RPLND, and uh, the patient has uh, is node negative. So you found no viable tumor, uh, no viable cancer in the RPLND. Uh, then most people universally will manage that patient with uh, surveillance, and that is most certainly the preferred strategy because you have basically uh, confirmed that they do not have cancer in their retroperitoneum. Um, however, if the patient has N1, it is also reasonable to consider uh, surveillance because relapse in these patients is only about 10% at five years, and giving universal chemotherapy to them would overtreat uh, a, a lot of patients. Um, however, if you have a node or N2 or N3, uh, usually uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, EP times two, BEP times two for N2, and then EP times three or EP times four for N3 is the preferred strategy after. And I think the thing to acknowledge here is that if you compare this to primary chemotherapy for good risk clinical node positive disease, which is either EP times four or BEP times three, doing a primary or RPLND actually lowers the burden of chemotherapy in early stage node positive men because the presumption and, and, and the fact of the matter is that if you find cancer in these patients, they would have relapsed and then they would have gotten uh, chemotherapy for relapse according to their risk, which is most commonly good risk, and that would be EP times four or BEP times three. So that is why doing this uh, primary RPLND up front actually decreases the chemotherapy burden, because then if you're looking at N1 or N2, then you're considering a lower, uh, fewer cycles of chemotherapy. So uh, the primary RPLND itself, um, this is a major operation. Uh, uh, usually uh, requires uh, a fair amount of surgical planning and setup. Um, you're essentially mobilizing the bowel uh, and small intestine uh, off of the retroperitoneum. Uh, this is moved out of the way to expose the great vessels and the lymph node packets. Um, I think uh, it, the, these are operations that uh, are, are not terribly frequent in some centers and are, are concentrated at other centers, um, but it's important to understand sort of how to set up this operation, how to get uh, the view that you want, which is right over here, um, and this is the uh, usually the view of the retroperitoneum after the bowel is mobilized and placed uh, either on the chest if you're doing it open or, or aside if you're doing it robotically. Uh, and this is a demonstration of the split and roll technique where you are accessing the great vessels on the anterior aspect of these vessels because the uh, vasculature is more predictable in those areas and you're able to safely get into the retroperitoneum to access these uh, lymph node packets. Um, and this is just an example of uh, starting this operation, although uh, a, a lot of times this starts actually over the vena cava. Nerve sparing is a very frequently tested uh, component of, of uh, testis cancer on the in-service. And the things to remember here are which nerves really need to be spared in order to preserve anti-grade ejaculation and not have the patient become anejaculatory. 
And this is the sympathetic chain, the postganglionic sympathetic fibers, and then the hypogastric plexus. Those are the three to remember. Um, they are, as you can see here, sort of snuck behind the vena cava uh, on the right side and on the left side, they run pretty parallel to the aorta all the way down to the area of the IMA, which is where you typically find the hypogastric plexus, um, which is usually tucked right under the IMA and a little bit above the bifurcation there. And as you can see here, um, doing this operation open, the nerves are usually identified with vessel loops and really very finely dissected out to preserve. Um, most of the time you need uh, at least one uh, uh, nerve to really uh, feel that you have successfully preserved uh, the nerves, uh, but the more is certainly better. So templates are a bit of a controversial thing. I don't want to belabor this too much, but uh, templates were initially, from a historical perspective, proposed and used to preserve ejaculation. This was uh, a championed by the Indiana group. Uh, in expert hands, however, a true nerve sparing RPLND, regardless of your template dissection, if you're able to identify and preserve the nerves, does preserve ejaculatory function in up to 90% of patients. Um, the uh, templates that are proposed are usually related to the landing, uh, the landing zones that I had previously discussed, where a right-sided uh, testis uh, case is going to involve the paracaval, pre-caval, and interaortic cable nodes, whereas the left side is going to involve the interaortic cable nodes, the pre-aortic, and the para-aortic nodes, all the way up to the hilum, which is the general uh, dissection template, and down to the ureter where it crosses the iliacs. Um, there is a small risk of the template dissection, and this is where I am editorializing a little bit. Um, uh, depending on the template, the risk, of dissection, uh, the risk of residual disease in the retroperitoneum can be up to 23%. And this is done uh, in some nice mapping studies that Scott Egner and, and Dr. Scheinfeld had done uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and they showed that this increased risk uh, and the percentage of potential disease actually increased with more advanced disease. I think it's important to uh, really, really take a, a strong look at, at uh, whether the template is really the right dissection when you're doing these cases, uh, because there is a risk of missing the treatment window if you do leave disease behind, and it definitely does increase the uh, treatment burden, uh, which would be RPLND and full-dose chemotherapy. Uh, a brief word on robotic versus open surgery. Um, the concerns uh, regarding the uh, robotic technique have been recently published in the last two years by the Indiana Group, and they and they show that there was a uh, potential for some adverse surgical outcomes, including some very atypical spread with the robotic approach. Now, I, I don't really know um, the exact mechanism for all of this, and I don't think anyone really does, but I think it's an important thing to at least be aware of that there is some concern that this is happening. So systemic treatments of advanced testis cancer. So just briefly to go over this, because this is another thing that's tested, the four most common agents that are used uh, for chemotherapy are bleomycin, atoposide, cisplatin, and carboplatin. Each have a slightly different uh, mechanism of action outside of the uh, platinum agents. Uh, bleomycin is, uh, inflicts direct DNA damage. Atoposide is an alkylating agent, so it binds DNA, whereas cisplatin and carboplatin are DNA crosslinkers, which causes DNA damage. And it's uh, a good thing just to look at these the night before. Again, potential memorization. Uh, bleomycin, the thing that everyone talks about, and everyone and appropriately so, is the potential for pulmonary toxicity, pneumonitis, and Raynaud's disease. Um, as I'll touch on in a second, the increased risk of a fourth cycle of bleomycin is really where the pulmonary toxicity takes it to the next level and really becomes a significant factor, whereas atoposide, cisplatin, and carboplatin generally have myosuppressive uh, adverse effects. And then the usual neuro uh, nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, and neurotoxicity. So things actually get a little bit easier from here when it comes to management because all metastatic germ cell tumors, whether it's no uh, node positive or M positive, can be managed with first line risk stratified cisplatin based chemotherapy. So if you have someone with lymph nodes positive or widely metastatic disease, you know that you can manage these patients with a, with a cisplatin based chemotherapy approach. The two caveats and the two things to remember as, as uh, exceptions to that rule are the consideration of our, our primary RPLND in early stage two non-SEM, provided that the serum tumor markers are negative, and early uh, stage 2AB seminoma, if there's non-bulky disease, you can offer radiation therapy. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of those. So primary RPLND in these situations is... Uh, has similar clinical benefits to a primary RPLND in stage 1B disease. Um, this is just that there's a very much higher potential of having a viable germ cell tumor discovered in the retroperitoneal specimen, so it generally requires a slightly uh, uh, different approach. 
The thing to remember about RPLND is that RPLND should never really be performed with elevated serum tumor markers. Now, there are exceptions to that, of course, as there are with all things. But if you're asked about a patient who has had chemotherapy and is ready to have uh, RPLND and they have elevated serum tumor markers, the right answer is probably not RPLND outside of a desperation RPLND, which is only after two rounds, so induction and salvage chemotherapy. But so you're usually uh, performing RPLND in patients with normal serum tumor markers. Uh, in this situation, again, normal markers usually only performed if there's very predictable lymph node drainage, so the patient has not had prior hernia repair, has not prior had prior undescended testes repair, and really uh, with, with low volume sort of uh, uh, lymph nodes in a, in a predictable landing zone uh, that, that appear easily resectable. Similar to node positive disease of primary RPLND for stage one disease, the chemotherapy afterwards is based on your pathologic node stage. So if, it's, if by some miracle you're N0, it's surveillance, N1 surveillance is considered because of that low risk of relapse. However, N2 and N3 uh, usually get chemotherapy. And again, this can potentially lower the burden of chemo in early stage men. Now, radiation therapy in steminoma in stage 2A and 2B seminoma, uh, this is an option if there is not bulky uh, greater than 3 centimeter disease. So if the disease is less than 3 centimeters, you can consider this. Uh, the radiation field is a modified dog leg field, which includes the periortic and the ipsilateral iliac lymph nodes. Uh, and it's uh, a consideration also to in include the inguinal lymph nodes and a scar if there is uh, a history of hernia repair on that side as well. So risk-based chemotherapy, this is, I think, uh, an important slide to remember uh, because it kind of breaks it all down. If you have good risk disease, you can consider BEP times three or EP times four. And then if you have intermediate or poor risk disease, you get BEP times four. And that's really where the line in the sand is drawn. So good risk, BEP times three or four, or EP times four, excuse me, and intermediate or poor risk disease, BEP times four. So there's a little bit of controversy about EP times four, BEP times three for good risk disease. Uh, both approaches are certainly considered standard of care. Uh, certain centers uh, prefer certain regimens. Uh, however, the direct comparison, comparative data is pretty sparse. There's really only one RCT uh, that has really done a good head-to-head -head comparison. And I've uh, pasted the three uh, below. Um, uh, and I think it's a good idea to remember that the benefits of EP in this situation is that there's less pulmonary toxicity and less Raynaud's because you're not giving bleomycin, and the benefits of BEP are actually a shorter duration of treatment, and there's less cisplatin exposure because it's four cycles of uh, cisplatin and EP times four, whereas there's three in BEP. So post-chemo management in seminoma, and then I'll discuss non-seminoma. So again, you're giving risk-based chemotherapy. It doesn't matter what their initial risk was. This is all managed the same. If there's complete resolution of all the masses or the masses are less than three centimeters in seminoma, the patient is managed with surveillance. And that's because the viable tumor risk in the retroperitoneum is very low, it's 3%. And the risk of actually doing an RPLND in, in uh, the post-chemo seminoma is actually quite difficult because of the desmoplastic reaction. So we try not to operate on these people, one, because it's difficult and, and fraught with complications, and two, because there's actually a low risk of, of active tumor in the retroperitoneum. However, if there is a residual mass greater than three centimeters, the management begins with a PET CT scan. So the PET CT scan is ordered. If it's negative, you're reassured. Um, it's got good specificity, um, so you can continue that patient on surveillance. However, if it's positive, you have to make a decision. Do you go ahead and resect it if it's resectable? If it looks questionably resectable, it's a good idea to biopsy or even to wait and repeat the PET CT scan, especially if the PET CT is equivocal. Now, the PET CT, uh, the, uh, just based on how the molecular chemistry of these work, um, this is based on uh, the cells being alive. So there could be some uh, continued cell death after chemotherapy, some residual uh, PET positivity uh, that is equivocal. So if there's any question, that the PET is positive before really uh, acting, it is a good idea to wait another six or so weeks, uh, especially after post-treatment, but you wait another month or two, wait even three to six months and get a, a, another PET CT to figure out if that is truly positive disease. And obviously if there's progression of disease and the tumor uh, grows or, or the serum tumor marker elevation, you can move on to second line chemotherapy in seminoma. Now non-SEM is managed differently. Again, you're starting with risk-based chemotherapy, and this is down the cascade, regardless of what your uh, chemotherapy regimen was or initial, um, initial risk status was. 
If the masses have completely resolved and they're less than one centimeter and there's normal serum tumor markers, you can consider surveillance or even a post-chemo RPLND. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the role of post-chemo RPLND in less than one centimeter masses in a sec. However, if there are greater than one centimeter masses uh, remaining after chemotherapy and there are normal serum tumor markers, uh, a post-chemo RPLND is indicated. Uh, and depending on what is found in the retroperitoneum, whether it's teratoma, fibrosis, necrosis, the patient goes on surveillance. If there's a viable germ cell tumor, then you're getting salvage chemotherapy, which is usually TIP, BIP, or EP times two. Again, if there's persistent marker elevation, the patient moves on to second-line salvage chemotherapy, which is generally TIP or VIP, uh, and there is an option for high-dose uh, uh, chemotherapy with stem cell transplant in, in patients as well. Um, so the principles of a post-chemo RPLND, these are always bilateral template. These are only performed when serum tumor markers are normal other than a desperation RPLND um, situation, which is uh, after at least two rounds of chemotherapy and uh, elevated markers that are not increasing. Um, for post-chemo RPLND, it's uh, important to refer or at least consider to refer uh, patients to high volume centers that do these a lot. Uh, consider pulmonary function tests for patients who have gotten bleo because of the concerns about pulmonary toxicity. And again, the routine situations for post-chemo RPLND in non-SEM is when you have a residual mass greater than one centimeter. In seminoma, it's a residual mass greater than three centimeters, and the PET or a biopsy are floridly positive for seminoma. And again, the less common uh, situations are desperation RPLND or the situation where there's growing teratoma, which is after a non-seminominous germ cell tumor gets chemotherapy, Markers are negative, and you have persistently growing mass in the retroperitoneum. This is called growing teratoma syndrome. And this is an upcoming desperation RPLND that uh, I'm going to tackle in the next few weeks. So you can see that some of these have uh, very, very large residual masses. So what are the risks of finding a certain pathology at the time of post-chemo RPLND? Um, the risk is based, obviously, on the type of cancer, whether it's seminoma, non-seminoma, and then uh, the, the salvage chemo situation versus primary chemo situation. The numbers to really uh, keep in mind here, I think, are the percentage of viable tumor after uh, uh, primary chemotherapy for non-sem is about 5 to 15 percent, about 35 percent teratoma, and the rest is necrosis, fibrosis. Those are the things that are really asked about uh, the most part. So I think if you remember the 15, 35, 50 numbers, you're probably going to get most of those uh, questions, or at least to have a, a chance at answering those. As I mentioned, um, the risk of each type of uh, retroperitoneal pathology is most closely related to stage. So the higher stage disease, obviously, you're going to be on the upper uh, aspects of, of those uh, percentage estimates. So very briefly, uh, this is a controversial topic. I'm not really going to get deep into the woods here because I'm running out of time a little bit, but uh, certain centers do do routine post-chemo RPLND, even for patients who have had a complete response or have uh, less than one centimeter residual masses. However, according to guidelines, it is quite reasonable to consider surveillance in these patients as well. So briefly to touch on the risks of chemotherapy, as I mentioned, uh, both chemotherapy and radiation therapy to the retroperitoneum have uh, considerable side effects. Uh, the cardiovascular risks, I think, are underappreciated when it comes to cisplatin and bleomycin-based chemotherapy. Uh, and based on how many cycles of chemo you get in these situations, uh, some of these risks are actually related or, or similar to the uh, risk of long-term uh, cigarette smoking. So these are non-negligible. Um, and then there's about two times the risk and risk of second cancer, uh, depending on the dose. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the fourth cycle in BEP is really the difference maker. And you can see here the, the rates of complications, uh, anemia, uh, neutropenia, pulmonary toxicity between the real uh, uh, different um, uh, chemotherapy regimens. And you can see just how increased uh, BEP times four when it is when it comes to pulmonary toxicity with about a one to 2% risk of pulmonary uh, uh, treatment-related death. Second-line chemo, uh, this is rarely asked about, but you, you should know about it. Uh, men are still actually curable after uh, w with second- and third-line treatment strategies. So this is, this is an important component of, of getting to that cure. Uh, the most commonly used salvage regimens are TIP and VIP. Uh, High-dose chemotherapy with stem cell transplant is, is another option, and this is being studied in the TIGER trial, uh, which is being conducted at a few centers throughout uh, the world, I believe. And that's a phase three trial comparison of, of TICE, which is that regimen there, um, plus stem cell transplant versus uh, a, a standard uh, TIP. And post-chemotherapy surgery uh, remains a necessary component in these patients who respond, so this is managed just the same uh, as those prior algorithms. Um, 
as I alluded to, the outcomes of advanced germ cell tumors are good. Um, uh, good risk disease, uh, which is most of seminomas, has an 85% five-year survival and an 82% disease-free uh, survival. Uh, and then going over to non-SEM, you can see here the five-year survivals of good and intermediate risk disease are, are quite good, whereas poor risk disease, uh, th these are unfortunately the patients that do have the uh, potential to die of testis cancer. So it's very important to manage these patients uh, uh, very closely. Uh, so uh, when it comes to non-retroperitoneal and non-testis germ cell tumors, uh, uh, post-chemotherapy masses and, and tumors that arise from the mediastinum or the retroperitoneum should again be managed very similarly to those that arise from, uh, from the testis. Um, in, uh, in patients that have uh, residual disease in, in sites other than the retroperitoneum, uh, it is definitely a consideration to uh, remove these surgically. Uh, however, it's important to understand that there is a very high chance of discordant pathology depending on where uh, the site of disease is. Now, surveillance uh, is an important component of treatment, obviously. Um, this is something that I think uh, should be given a look again the night before. Uh, all these protocols are risk-based and differ uh, based on uh, the timing and the risk and the, the, what the initial pathology was, seminoma or non-seminomatous. All of these protocols are most intensive in the first two years, and that's the difference between an early and late relapse. Um, uh, you know, there's very little science that supports exactly what regimen uh, is, is necessary, and that's why I didn't want to spend too much time on this. It's just kind of what we do. Um, and, and even with all of that, you know, a lot of patients are non-compliant or didn't have guideline concordant surveillance. Uh, but most of them involve a history and physical, an exam, definitely a scrotal exam at each visit, uh, check serum tumor markers, a chest x-ray, and then abdominal pelvic imaging, depending on whether the retroperitoneum was controlled with surgery or uh, the patients on uh, primary surveillance. Uh, RPLND does obviate the need for long-term RP surveillance in most regimens, so that is a benefit of doing a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection is that you do not have to get long-term CTs on these patients because technically it is controlled. Um, and the NCCN now says that serum tumor markers are optional for surveillance of seminoma, although I continue to use them because I think you have the potential to catch some stuff. So other testis masses, uh, this is about 5% of, of uh, testes masses, of strom cell, stromal cell tumors, majority of which are lytic cell tumors, uh, most of which are benign, uh, only about 10% are malignant. And, and the way this has always been described is that the only way you know that a lytic cell tumor is malignant is if it metastasizes. And this is similar to that Supreme Court justice that was talking about uh, uh, pornography back in the day. He said, I know it when I see it. And, and unfortunately, that's the only real way of, of diagnosing a malignant lytic cell tumor. Uh, the uh, pathologic pearl here is the presence of Reinke crystals, which are these little sort of coffin-shaped things that are seen in, in uh, a pathology specimen of lytic cell tumors. These present with increased testosterone, uh, gynecomastia, impotence, decreased libido, and infertility. Um, and uh, if they are metastatic, they are resistant to chemo and XRT, so you should consider uh, RPLND. Uh, sarcomas are also tested. A liposarc is the most common thing you're going to get, a peritesticular liposarcoma. Um, it's also important to consider uh, the potential for rhabdomyosarcoma in young men. Uh, the hallmarks of, of treating these are really to attempt an R0 resection. That is a complete resection, and usually an inguinal archaeotomy with a wide excision in order to get that R0 resection and to consider uh, XRT uh, for high-risk patients because local recurrence is common in liposarcomas. Now, for all sarcomas that are not liposarcomas, uh, you can consider primary RPLND plus or minus adjuvant chemo uh, in those. Uh, lymphoma is quite common in men over 50. Only about 30 to 40% are actually bilateral, uh, despite the teaching that these are, are commonly uh, bilateral testis tumors in older men. Uh, testes are actually a sanctuary site in lymphoma, so sometimes the lymphoma doctors will ask us to do an orchiectomy for a testis cancer because the chemotherapy cannot penetrate there, so that does happen. Uh, and then if you diagnose a cystadenoma, uh, these are usually found bilaterally, and this is uh, certainly not a testis question, but uh, think about VHL because that is part of the constellation of, uh, of, of signs in VHL. So a quick word about survivorship. As I've discussed and hopefully relayed, uh, most of the treatment strategies allow, um, uh, allow for excellent outcomes, and it's important to really weigh the risks of what we do to patients to try to cure them uh, with actually curing them. Um, uh, the cisplatin-based chemos, uh, 
uh, radiation therapy, these all put very young patients at 40, 50, 60 years of risk for cardiovascular disease, secondary cancers, uh, as well as infertility, including all of the other chemo-related adverse effects. So it's important to discuss these with patients and, and tailor uh, your treatment strategy uh, based on the uh, preferences of the patient and, and certainly their comorbidities as well. And long-term follow-up not only should be monitoring patients for disease recurrence, but also monitoring uh, patients for the late effects of these cancers. Um, again, fertility considerations, I think, is, a, uh, is very important to discuss with patients, uh, and you can consider offering, uh, or you, can, you should offer, and the patient can consider getting a prosthesis at the time of orchiectomy. Uh, so this is me and the boss, uh, previously operating, doing uh, a big case uh, during fellowship, and I was wondering if there's any questions before we tackle into some SASP questions. I think we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. No questions in the chat so far, I think. Uh... I'll, I'll let you know if anyone posts anything, but you can go ahead and get started on some questions. All right, cool. So I think, uh, yeah. So I took a look at the last five years of SASP questions, which are usually somewhat reflective of uh, what's actually on the exam. Um, and as you can see, there were more testless questions uh, in 2016 uh, and then trended towards fewer. Uh, in 2020, but you can see some themes here over and over again when you're looking at what the topics are. Um, you know, they ask a lot about uh, uh, orchiectomy management through a transcrotal incision. Uh, they ask a lot about basic anatomy when it comes to RPLND and the retroperitoneum, uh, and, and they ask a lot about post-chemo RPLND management. So I think if you're going to focus on, on particular themes, uh, it's certainly uh, a good idea to consider these, these high-yield uh, topics. So we're going to go through a few questions uh, before 8 o'clock, and, and I'll end at 8 and just get through a few questions here and see if there's any other uh, pressing uh, questions that come up. So 23-year-old guy undergoes transcrotal orchiectomy demonstrating a mixed uh, non-seminomous germ cell tumor uh, with lymphovascular vascular invasion. Two markers and metastatic evaluation are negative. In addition to the RPLND and excision of the spermatic cord and uh, scrotal scar, treatment should include... So I'm not going to belabor these because uh, I'm not going to ask anyone these questions really, but uh, the answer here is A, and that's observation. Uh, and the reality here is that in patients who are managed with uh, transcrotal orchiectomy, uh, there's really very, very low risk of, of uh, recurrence for most patients. There are some exceptions to that, but uh, this meta-analysis that they cite here uh, really does show that there's less than 1% chance of, of local recurrence in these patients. Uh, however, the flip side of that coin is that the AUA guidelines for the management of testicular cancer um, do say that uh, it, it, although these are rare, at least adjunctive treatment, whether it's excision of the scrotal scar or radiotherapy, should be considered for local control. But this cites a similar study. So unless they're hitting you over the head with uh, the reason why this patient is going to have a local recurrence, I think it's safe to say that these can be managed with surveillance alone. And then if you're doing surgery, excision of the scar. So for optimal maintenance of ejaculation during a right-sided nerve-sparing RPLND, the surgeon should uh, preserve. And this is uh, what I discussed earlier. These are the postganglionic sympathetic fibers, uh, and these are running behind the vena cava and crossing over to the left, where they meet up with the other contralateral sympathetic trunk, which runs adjacent and parallel to the aorta. Uh, the uh, the postganglionic fibers are running off of that sympathetic chain, and heading towards the superior hypogastric plexus. So just knowing these three uh, different nerve fibers and knowing where they are in the retroperitoneum will allow you to answer a lot of these questions. So this is a non-testis question. So this is a 60-year-old guy with erectile dysfunction that has a non-palpable right testicle. So this is an elderly gentleman who's got a non-palpable right testicle. Uh, the ultrasound uh, reveals a, a two by two centimeter uh, homogeneous ovoid mass consistent with the testicle at the right internal ring. Uh, it does not show any internal uh, uh, hypoechoic or hyperechoic lesions consistent with cancer. So they're asking you what to do about this patient. And I, and I do agree with uh, this answer here, which is observation, uh, because this, this mass is actually um, uh, quite normal in this situation and uh, the patient has lived to 60 without any issues developing uh, and the risk of, of developing a cancer uh, after this is probably quite low and may actually be uh, lower than the risk of doing surgery on this patient. So in this particular case, observation is the answer. Uh, 
However, uh, hearkening back to the what I mentioned prior, uh, surgery for undescended testes and the risk of testis cancer uh, post-pubertal surgery um, will not really mitigate uh, the risk of, of testis cancer and undescended testes. So if you're going to operate on these patients, uh, it is a good idea to do so earlier and before puberty. So the IMA is ligated during an RPLND for testis cancer. This is something that happens quite commonly, especially in uh, post-chemo RPLNDs with bulky residual masses. Uh, and the blood supply to the sigmoid colon is now derived from which artery? And this is just a basic anatomy question. Um, this kind of highlights the uh, uh, cascades coming off of the IMA and the SMA when it comes to um, um, supplying the colon. These are just, uh, you know, these, these are memorization and knowing your anatomy. You know, the IMA is going to come off. You're going to get the left colic coming up and towards the descending colon there. Uh, and then the sigmoid going down and, and, and anastomosing with the superior rectals, uh, which are also going to have some uh, uh, um, anastomoses with uh, the, the vessels coming off the internal iliac. So um, this is less interesting here. A 25-year-old guy has a left uh, squirrel exploration, subsequent orchiectomy. Uh, pathological staging reveals a non-SEM clinical 2B and after full dose chemotherapy, he's got a residual three centimeter paraaortic mass. Next steps are RPLND and. So this is basically asking you or telling you that uh, the patient's going to have the RPLND. And they're again asking you what to do about the uh, scrotal scar. And in this particular situation, uh, again, um, you're gonna remove the spermatic cord remnant, but uh, not do anything about the uh, uh, scar at this point. So how many more do we have here? I, I think that's eight o'clock. I do want to give uh, give some time if there's any other questions or anything that I may have uh, glazed over a little fast that folks want to that folks want to discuss in a little bit more depth, because these questions are all kind of available to go over independently. No questions from the crowd here. Um... Uh, we have one, we have one coming in. We have, uh, would you stage a scrotal violation as a T4? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a pretty accepted, uh, a pretty accepted um, uh, way, of, way of going about that. However, you know, if, if the patient does not have any uh, signs of metastatic disease, uh, for, for most people that is managed uh, no, no differently. And so the take-home message about the, the um, scrotal scar management is usually you don't do anything, but what are situations where you would? Yeah, the, the guidelines are ambiguous. Uh, the, the answer to that question is that there's no great answer. I mean, I think it's a very good idea to consider scar excision. Um, I think it's a good idea to consider um, uh, adjuvant radiation therapy if you're excising something. Uh, like a, uh, a liposarcoma, um, but in most cases, it is it is safe to um, ob observe. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's 7.01, so I don't want to keep, uh, keep people too much longer. Um, I'm just going to pull up the upcoming Empire calendar here. Uh, Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Matulitz. Uh, that was really a fantastic review, and, and we really appreciate your, you giving us your time and your expertise here. Uh, you provided some great structure about testicular cancer and really got down to the, the high-yield details. So, so uh, I appreciate that, and I'm sure everyone here does as well. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining in. You can join us again next week. We have some great talks on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, we'll have some talks about penile cancer and pediatric GU tumors. So make sure to join us for those. Um, note the change in day from the usual Monday and Thursday routine. Thanks everyone for tuning in and have a great evening.